Okay, so to start today, let, let's do an exercise. Okay, everyone stand up. <laughs> <laughs> That's later. So remember we saw these three Reitermeister moves and we, we proved the theorem that uh, if two diagrams represent the same knot, so if two diagrams are equivalent, then you can go from one to the other by a sequence of these Reitermeister moves. So let's do an exercise. Supposing I want to go from a picture that has two parallel strands like this to one that, uh, that looks like this. Okay, what, how do we get there by Reitermeister moves? Not quite R2, right? R2, I took the bottom one and I pushed it over the top one. You were taking the top one and pushing it over the bottom one. So if you were allowed to reflect, that would be fine. Yeah. No, no. There's no, yeah, right. There's no reflection allowed in these. You can start with the other one. You know what you can rotate? You rotate. That's true. You are allowed to do a planar isotopy. So you could just turn the whole thing upside down and then do it and then turn it back right side up again. Or if you like, you could take this. You can just do something like this. Okay, the, so you can deform, you're allowed to deform in the plane as long as you don't change any crossings. And now we can do one of these moves over here. So this is an R2 move as we, we defined it. And now you straighten out and it becomes a the other kind. Okay, let's try something a little harder. How about a move that takes this to to this? So this is not so sim not so simple. You can't just turn this one upside down. All right, well, I'll leave you to think about that one. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do it later. <laughs> but it can be done by a combination of these, of these other guys. And, and in fact, anything, there are several variations of this one. In this one, I moved the one that was in the back. But I might have wanted to move the one that was in the middle instead. So there are a few variations, and they all reduce to these three. OK, so. Yeah, that's right. But you would have more moves then. You would have. That's right. For the country, if you put the both of them, you have to show you that this is enough. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, nobody, nobody, nobody <laughs> complained before when I said these three. <laughs> now, you, now you want more moves. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So before we saw some of the techniques that were around before 1980 to distinguish knots. And now I want to show you something that was discovered in 1984 by Jones, which created a big, uh, a, a major change in the field and brought in connections to various other areas. And that was Jones, Vaughn Jones introduced the Jones polynomial. And he, 
he approached this by a, a rather different uh, method. He, he was studying C star algebras and looking at various ways of constructing C star algebras. Uh, realized that you could sort of weave them together using braids. And then uh, by uh, doing some algebra on the braids, found that certain polynomials came out that didn't uh, depend on how you drew the braid. And he realized he had a knot invariant. And uh, I want... So this was uh, very intensely studied by topologists after it was discovered, and, and pe people very quickly gave new proofs, new constructions, even generalizations, which I'll, I'll mention a little later. But uh, in 1986, there was a new construction of this Jones polynomial given by Kaufman, and that's what I'm going to describe now, which is extremely simple. So it, it will only take a few minutes to give a complete proof that there's this very powerful invariant of knots. So that's what I want to do now. So the idea introduced uh, by Kaufman is now called the Kaufman bracket. And what it is, it's written like this. So D is some diagram, and the bracket is is some polynomial in A and A minus. So it's a Laurent polynomial. So sum of powers of A and A inverse. And it's defined by the following uh, rules. The first thing we do is say what the value of this polynomial is on the trivial knot, the unknot, and we'll set it equal to 1. So this is a, a function on diagrams, not yet on, not yet on knots. What we'll have to do is show that this definition does not change when I do these Reitermeister moves, and then we'll be able to find knot and link invariants. The second condition is that if you take some diagram and then take the disjoint union with, the, with an unknotted component, <coughs> then you get the bracket polynomial of the original diagram. So here D is any diagram. And I'm not even going to need an orientation, so I don't have, I don't have to put directions on the, on the knots. We'll do an example in a minute. But this is going to now multiply by, by this strange looking factor, minus a to the minus 2 minus a squared. So that's what happens when you add a trivial component. So now we have a link. Before we had a diagram of perhaps a knot, perhaps some link. But now we definitely have two, at least one more component. And this polynomial multiplies in this way. And the third condition says that uh, if you have some diagram which has a crossing like this in it, so we're drawing part of the diagram near one crossing, and these things continue, and anything can happen outside this circle, then the value of this bracket on this diagram is equal to A times the value of the bracket on 
this diagram. So it's the same outside the circle, but here we've made a, a switch in this way, plus A inverse times the bracket, where we switch the other way. So the first question is, how, what distinguishes this switch from this switch? How did we say, how did we assign one to A and the other one to A inverse? So let's think for a minute about these, uh, about the nature of switches. So if I have something like this, I claim there's a, a way of distinguishing two ways of resolving this. One that looks like this and one that looks like this. So these, even though there's no arrows on this, so there's no sign to this crossing, we can still tell this guy apart from this guy. And that's because, it's really because the plane has an orientation. So we have a strand that goes over and a strand that goes under. And what, what our convention will be is that if as we're approaching this crossing on the over strand, on the top strand, if we go left, we can go left or right. So if we go left, we'll get this picture. So plus corresponds to go left from the over strand, the top strand, as you approach the crossing. And that's consistent. If you come from the other side and go left, so you go come from this side, you'll also, this side you'll go this way, and this side you'll go this way. So there's no, no choices to make there. So we'll call that the positive resolution, and the negative re resolution is the other one, where you go right as you, as you approach the... Okay, so this turned out to be the key idea, that you could do this without any orientations on the, on the link. And uh, let me say one more thing. We can also take these, and this will come in useful in a minute, we can take the four regions near this crossing, and the two regions that, here yeah, this, these two regions become connected when we do the plus resolution, so we'll put a, a little plus near there, and these two regions become connected when we do the other resolution, so we can put a minus there, so we can put pluses and minus minuses corresponding to this near this crossing. And that will be useful in a minute. Okay, so now we see that this makes sense. We know how to choose which one gets the A and which one gets the A inverse. And so let's do an example. Of, let's compute this uh, bracket for an example. So let's take, uh, say, this link. Okay, so I, I don't have any arrows on this. It's an unoriented diagram. And we'll compute its bracket. So we'll choose some crossing to resolve. Let's say this one. And this rule over here tells me that the value of the bracket on this diagram is equal to A times this resolution. So when we do that resolution inside this yellow circle, we'll change it to, to look like this. <coughs> and elsewhere it's unchanged. So it looks like this, plus A inverse times the bracket of the other resolution, which looks like like that. So now we have to go again to do this again to resolve these other two crossings. You can see that this this process grows exponentially. Yes, but it's not. We don't know that it's a. Uh, it 
if we knew that it only depended on the knot type, we wouldn't need to. But in fact, it's, it's not quite correct. So no, not, not quite. In fact, we'll see. Uh, if this was the odd knot, this would be 1. Right? So let's see what it actually is. It's not 1. Question? The, little, the yellow circle? Well, the yellow circle was just to focus your attention there. It doesn't actually do anything. It's just to focus. The, uh, no. no, no. It's just uh, like this circle here. Yeah. So this doesn't really need to be there. So now we continue and resolve this one. So we'll get an A times A term, an A squared term. And what will we get when we do the resolution there? which is the one that, as we go over, we go to the left, right? So we'll get, something like that, two, right, the, a link with two unknotted components. And then we'll get an, an A times an A inverse when we do the other resolution here, which would, which will give us what? So that will be this one. And then we get an A inverse times A when we do the plus resolution on this one. We already saw the plus resolution is the one that goes like this, so. Let's see. The uh, no. No, no, I don't think it's clear. So what what will we uh, what will we get this time? Uh, we start with this one, and then we have to we have to resolve this one using the a. So as with the a, you come in and you go to the left. So you get this, and then there's an a to the minus two. And that gives us again <coughs> so we, we can learn a lot from this example, so I'll leave it up for a minute uh, but let's do the finish the computation and actually get the value of the polynomial. The value of the polynomial Uh, that yeah, the pictures have to be the same. You're you're right because. Uh, well, it's true because there's a there's some symmetry or something. But in general, it's a, yeah, it's true because there's enough symmetry. Um, so anyway, so we get a squared, and now we can put in the value of the polynomial for these two, because we know it's. For two, for an unknot union, an unknot, it's one, the polynomial for the unknot times this. So for this case, it's the value of the bracket on one, on an unknot times this coefficient. So that's minus a to the minus two minus a squared. And then we have twice the value on the unknot, which is two, two times one. And then here we have a to the minus 2 times the value of the bracket on, uh, on two on knots, which is right the same as this. <coughs> so we multiply and add together. And let's put the answer over here, because we'll need it later. I think you know what the right of ice moves are by now. So we get that the bracket of this hop flink, this is called the hop flink, is equal to, if I got it right, a to the minus, uh, well, minus a to the fourth, minus a to the minus fourth. Is that right? Uh, 
Okay, so on the other hand, what another thing we saw here is that the the value of the bracket on uh, on these uh, on this guy is not the same as the value on the unknot, right? Because remember we. We saw that it was, uh, well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll compute this. This is, this is maybe worth a, a separate computation. What's the value of the bracket on, what is the, bra what happens when we put one of these things into a, into a diagram? Well, this rule tells us that, so what's the formula? It's, it's A times this, A times the bracket. So this is, di this is a diagram with an extra little kink on it. You get A times the original diagram plus A inverse times the diagram with a little, a little circle put, up, put on. So, so this is A times the diagram we started with before we put a kink there. And then here we get an A inverse times minus a squared minus a to the minus 2. <coughs> so, right. So, what... What we'll do is we'll get the original, the effect of adding a kink is to take the, the diagram without the kink and then multiply it by, by what? You, well, you get a minus a cubed. Uh, well, y y this, gives you a, this gives us a minus a and a plus a, which cancel. So we'll just multiply by minus a cubed to the minus three, excuse me. And if we, if we had done it the other way around, so this, in other words, what I'm showing here is this is not invariant. This, this bracket is not invariant on the type itemized to move. Yes, that's <laughs> that's true. But it's a polynomial; it, it's not preserved. And in this case, we would get uh, let's see, is it minus eight to the cubed? Let me see so I got it right. Yeah. So it's not invariant on the a type 1 Reitemeister to move, which seems like a problem because we're looking for invariance, which, uh, which we like to be in, in, invariant. However, it's almost, uh, it's almost as good. So the theorem that Kaufman proved is that it is invariant on the type 2 and type 3 Reitemeister to moves. It's not invariant under R1, as we see here, but we can correct for that by using the rise. We'll put in a corresponding term using the rise that cancels this change, and then we'll get a polynomial that's invariant under all three right the moves, and that polynomial is the Jones polynomial. So let's see why it's invariant under R2. So this was the theorem of Kaufman. Well, I, I will, yeah, I, was, I haven't done it yet. I'll, I'll show you in detail in a minute. So let's first check that it is already invariant under R2 and R3. So let's suppose we have some diagram which has two parallel strands in it. And we change this diagram 
to a diagram D prime in which we've introduced uh, a type two right of Meister move. So let's, con let's calculate the value of the bracket polynomial on D prime. So we have two crossings, two new crossings. So our rule says that we can resolve them one at a time. So first we'll, we'll take A times the resolution of this guy. So we'll start with this one. And then the rest of it stays the same. Plus A inverse times the other switch, which is Which is this one? So the rule says that the bracket of this guy is equal to the sum of these two. And now this one we can resolve again. And so we'll get an a squared times the bracket of this time when you do the a, as you go over, you go to the left, so you go like this. And then you have a constant term, which is is the bracket of this, and then you have another constant term, a inverse times a, which is and finally you have an a to the minus 2 term, which is a Okay, so this is the term we want. There's, we've, uh, this is actually equal to the bracket of D. And these other three terms cancel. Right, because we have an A squared plus A minus squared times this picture. All three of these pictures are the same. Except for this one. This one has an extra circle. And that multiplies the value of the bracket by A squared minus a squared minus a to the minus 2. So you can see where that formula came from now. That, uh, that's why the, this was the constant. It was just what you needed to make the other two terms cancel so that this was preserved on the right of Meister 2. Okay, so put in this, this guy is equal to the bracket of, of this diagram times minus a squared minus a to the minus 2. That's using this rule here. When you add a circle, you multiply by minus a squared minus a to the minus 2. And now all three of these are the same picture and the coefficients cancel. So is there a multiple conceptual explanation or this works? That's it. This is, right, so this is combinatorial t uh, knot theory. There's, uh, yeah. So, I don't think that the Jones polynomial was more intuitive either. Somehow you 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 define and you check you check that it works, and there is sort of an intuitive picture of what this means through Witten's work on uh, path integrals. So Witten Witten later interpreted this as the integral of some churn simons field in uh, the three sphere along the curves, um, and that's been. That's been studied quite a lot now also. So that, that, that perhaps does give you some me idea of what the meaning is. But many of these combinatorial invariants have no, no uh, meaning other than what comes out of these yeah, formulas. Is the formal similarity between all these scan relations and the polynomials? Right. I don't know if this was really ever no, this was, uh, understood at the That's certainly uh, been looked at, yeah. So the complexity results come from the Tut polynomial, for example. That's right. 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 So people have created various kinds of algebraic objects that that correspond to this, but I don't. So you know you can you can say you're counting some kind of algebraic objects, but I don't know if it adds any real intuition. I have also a question. Yes. When you do this uh, thing on the right when you, you know, explain the 
expand it all the way, eventually you get just the uh, and that yes. to to you. That's right. But in the planning uh, there are many different such drive like Right. You, you can nest in different ways. You can nest in many different ways. Right. We ignore so that in this. The question is, is there still a final not diagram? <laughs> That's a good question, actually. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't think the nesting has been used yet. There is, but you can, what, another thing you can do is keep track of the intermediate pictures all the way down. And that, essentially, if you do that, you can, you get, so you get this cube's worth of diagrams at the end. and. You can uh, turn it into a cell complex and create a cohomology theory out of it, and that's Kovanov homology. Uh, so there is more structure in it than just the final pictures. Uh, just this, but uh, I don't, as far as I know, the the nesting is not has not been used. The, so the ne this nesting, yeah. for example, the the guy at the end, is that inherent? So if you did the, the yeah, that, that's a good question actually. So so let me. Uh, that's what I I'm going to talk about now. So, so I won't do the, you can see this computations take, take a while and the, it's easy to make a mistake. So I won't do the R3 computation, but you, it's, a, it's very similar to this. It cancels out and, and you see that when you do the right of mice, the three moves, this uh, bracket stays the same. So the question is now, that, that have we really defined this bracket now? If we say it uh, satisfies these three conditions, is it well defined for a given diagram? Because you, the, what, what, the way to comp compute it is you pick a crossing and change it, and you keep going, and you get more and more terms. Eventually, you get, if you have C crossings, you have two to the C terms. Does it matter what order you pick the crossing changes in? It, it's not clear that it's well defined yet. It may depend on, on the ordering. But in fact, it's, it's, it does not depend on the ordering, so let's see why. So this was one of Kaufman's, Kaufman's theorem. It says that this is well defined. And the way you see this is that you actually give a, we'll give a formula for it that doesn't depend on the ordering. And the formula is called a, a state formula. So this is inspired by, by statistical mechanics where you look at all the states of a system. So we can think of our diagram. So let's, let's go back to this example. It, this diagram, had, we, can, we can assign to it certain states. So a state will be defined as follows. First, we order the crossings. So we'll label them from 1 to C, the C crossings. And now a state will be a, fu a function from the integers from 1 to C to plus or minus 1. So it will be a point in uh, plus or minus 1 to the C, the cube of dimension C. and. Uh, Each state gives us a way of resolving this diagram to a collection of curves. So for example, let's take the state uh, S, which takes uh, crossing 1 to plus 1 and crossing 2 to minus 1, say. What does this state, how does this state give us a collection of curves? Well, it tells us do the plus resolution at crossing 1. So the plus resolution would be this one. Uh, 
and it says do the minus resolution at crossing 2. So the minus resolution is this one. Okay, so remember the plus resolution as you come in, you go to the left. The net minus resolution as you come into the crossing on the top, you go to the right. So this is the resolution, the way of resolving all these crossings corresponding to state S. And we'll call this SD, the result of acting by the state S on the diagram D. And we'll also say that the number of curves in SD is equal to, to this. In this case, it's equal to 1. So this, re this re represents the number of curves in this total, totally resolved diagram. And then it's easy to see that this uh, Kaufman polynomial says that the value of this polynomial is the sum over all the states, all ways of resol resolving, because when you do this iterative process, you take all resolutions at all crossings. And what's the power, for a particular state, what's the power of A that you get? Well, it's the number of plus, cross, plus resolutions you get to get to that state. Every time you, you resolve with a plus uh, resolution, you pick up a power of A as you go down to that, that final totally resolved state. So the number of the number of plus signs in this state, in this case, the number of plus signs. Yes, that's right. Minus, because when you, when you, yeah, that's a better way to say it. <laughs> it's correct. So when you resolve, you multiply by A if you do a plus resolution. You multiply by A in inverse if you do a negative resolution. So the sum is how many, pow is the final power of A. The sum of the pluses and minuses in the state. In this case, it's zero. So this state would consider would contribute just a, a term which is a0, but then you have to multiply by something which tells you how many curves you wind up at the end. You have to use this rule. Once you've gotten rid of all the crossings, all you have is a collection of disjoint curves, and this tells you that the value of the bracket on that is a minus a to the minus 2 minus a squared. And the power here is, is 1 minus the number of, is the number of components minus 1. Right? If it's one component, you just multiply. You don't have any term of this. If there's two components, you'll get one term of this. So the number of components minus 1 is uh, is what that particular term will contribute. So this is a, an expression which gives you the bracket polynomial. Let me write it down here so we'll have it for later. So, so this also shows that even if you give the nesting information, it doesn't depend on the right. right, because it's So let's write this formula down. So that both gives a formula and shows that the Kaufman bracket is well defined. It doesn't depend on ordering. Let's do a little exercise.
Okay, which one gets the A and which one gets the A inverse? Right. Okay, this is, this is, you know, when you really, maybe I'm doing this a little fast, but when you really do this, this is the hard, usually the hardest part of the computation is to, is to get this step correct. You see, does everybody see why this is the A? Because when you come in and jump down to the left, you get the A term. Okay, so that is, uh, the bracket and its state description, and we've shown that it's well-defined. But it's not quite a, a not and link invariant because although it's preserved under type two and type three moves, it's not preserved under type one moves. Okay, so now we can define the Jones polynomial. And the Jones polynomial will, will be a combination of the bracket and a Rice term, and they could, they'll be combined in such a way that they don't, together, they don't uh, change on the, any of the three Reitermeister right moves. So we'll take an oriented link, link diagram. Okay, so now, let me maybe do an example while I, while I define this. Well, here we still have this example. This time, let's put the orientations on the, on the two components. Okay, so this is the object that we're going to define a, a link invariant to. And we'll define uh, VL is going to be some polynomial in A. Laurent polynomial in A, which is going to be defined to be minus A to the minus 3 times the right of L times the bracket of L. Right. So we'll see that it, we'll see that that's right by, in a, in a second, so this is called the Jones polynomial. So, right, so WL is the rise of L. Uh, the rise. So, the rise of link L is equal to the sum over the crossings of the sine of the crossing. So uh, we now have a we now have an orientation on the link, so we can assign a using the, our right hand we assign a plus sign or minus sign to each crossing, according to you know whether it matches or doesn't match uh, the right hand rule. So this right when you the point. Let's remember how the right changed. Well, let, let's compare to, let's see what happens with a right of Meister 1 move. Uh, I don't want to erase that yet. Hmm? The, the rule for A's and A's, okay. Right, so that's how the, this tells us how the right changes. Now, these aren't oriented, so you might worry about that. But it turns out that for these pictures, you get the same sign no matter which way you orient the curve. So if you reverse the orientation here, you'll change the arrows on two, two curves going through this point, so you won't change the sign of the right. Okay, so Do you, do you need one arm to the right of L? 
No, it's, we just use this the sum. Yeah, in the linking number, I use the half, but uh, we don't we don't use it in the right. <coughs> so let's let's see that this is preserved under each of the itemized moves. So first of all, this is preserved under Reitermeister 2 and 3, and so is this. So it's only Reitermeister 1 that, that needs to be checked. So the theorem is that this is a link invariant. Yeah, it's an invariant of uh, of oriented knots and links. So we've checked R2 and R3 already, so let's see what happens with R1. So let's suppose we have a link which, well, let's say that D is a, a link that has a strand like this, and d prime is a link that has a strand that differs only by having one of these right amongst the one moves in it. So let's look at the Jones polynomial evaluated on this on this diagram with the with the link. Well, by definition, this is equal to minus a to the minus 3 times the rise of this link, which has the kink in it. We don't know what it is away from here, but and then you multiply by the by the bracket of this diagram with, with the kink in it. And now this is minus a to the minus 3 times the rise of this diagram without the kink. Well, we, when we, what was the kink here? Was it, uh, what was the sign of this? Was it plus 1 or minus 1? The way I've done it here. This is, this is plus 1, right? Uh, I, was, I checked with my left hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's minus one. So the right, it's the right of this one minus one. And then what happens when we take this and re replace it by the bracket of this one? So now we have to use this rule here. The bracket of this guy is the bracket of this one, and we multiply by minus a to the minus 3. So they cancel, right? So this is V, uh, this is what I called VD, FA, and this is uh, VD prime. So we see that two diagrams that differ by one of these moves have the same, the same Jones polynomial. So now this is invariant under all three moves. So we have an interesting new invariant. It, it's, in, it, it's, it's an invariant of oriented links. It's not trivial. It takes many different values. We've already seen that. So uh, let's see what, it, what we can learn now by applying this. So it wasn't obvious when this was introduced that it would be more powerful than the other invariants, but it turned out to be extremely powerful and still somewhat un, unclear as to why it's so powerful. 
But one of the things it did was solve a conjecture from the 1890s about knots called the Tate conjecture. And I'm going to try and explain that. But before we do that, let me show you some simpler applications. And also let me say something about uh, So first of all, Jones introduced this by a different method, and he didn't use A as the variable. So this is just an aside. We won't, we won't work with this. But Jones used a different variable. So instead of A, he put T to the 1 fourth. So He got a polynomial, the Jones polynomial V sub L of T, using this variable, is in uh, It turns out that all the powers of A you'll see will always be even. So you get a power in T to the 1 half and T to the minus 1 half. So that's uh, not a significant difference. And we'll just stick with A today. So let's do a computation. Let's compute the, we haven't done much in the way of computation yet. Let's do the, comp, let's compute the Jones polynomial of the, uh, of the trefoil knot. Yeah, first we'll do the bracket, and then we'll do the right. So I'll have to do eight steps to do this, because we have to take, we have to resolve. So we've done some of these already, and if I kept track of it carefully, I could, I could take some shortcuts. But rather than, I think, I think you'll, you'll have to trust me uh, on this computation. So if, if you compute this, uh, if you compute this bracket, then what you wind up with is uh, yeah, but you still have to do you have to work work out eight terms. Yeah, it's, it's probably equally easy. So it, it winds up being a to the minus seven, minus a to the minus three, minus a to the fifth. And what's the rise of this? In the Jones polynomial, this is the bracket. So the rise of this, this I guess we could do. It's not too demanding. So what's that? They're all the same, and they're all pluses. So this is 3. You just add up the signs. I, I didn't, really I should orient it. So I, I was being a little sloppy there. A right is usually assigned to an oriented knot because you have to use the orientation. But if you have a, if you have a link, it's going to depend how you orient the various components. But if you have a knot, if you reverse the orientation, you get the same signs. So sometimes we don't pay too much attention for knots on, on the orientation. But in, in this case, it's three. And now we can as associate the the Jones polynomial to this knot. We just, what's our formula? It's uh, minus a to the minus three times three, so it's minus nine times this bracket. So the Jones polynomial of the trefoil is a to the minus 7, oops, minus a, no. 
That's the bracket. All right, so we multiply by minus n. So minus 16 minus a to the minus 12. That's a plus, no, no, isn't it? No, that's minus plus plus. The minus a to the minus a gives you a minus all over. So oh, it's a minus a, right, right. So that's minus plus plus. Okay, so that's the Jones polynomial of the trefoil knot, the positive trefoil knot. So we could do the same thing for the negative trefoil knot. And uh, it turns out in that case, we get a different answer. Let me show you what you get and see if you see the rule. There is a simple rule. So this is, this is the trefoil with uh, all the crossings reversed. The mirror image. And it's... Uh, Jones polynomial is all the powers have had their sign changed. So that's a general that's a general fact. When you take a mirror image, the signs all the powers all change sign. Let's see why. Yeah, that's that's, that's got to be the reason. So let's just think a minute about what what we mean by a mirror image of a knot. If we have if we have a crossing like this in a knot, then the mirror image is gotten by reflecting through a mirror, right? And we can take that mirror anywhere we want. So why don't we take the Think of this as sitting just above the blackboard and take the mirror to be the blackboard. So then the top, the topmost goes to the back. So the reflection. That's not. Well, no, you don't want to do that. No, no, because that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, that's just the rotation. That's orientation preserving. You really want to reflect it. You'll, you'll switch left and right if you do that as well. So for example, if we have something like this, when we reflect this, each of these crossings will change. And the orientations will stay, stay the, just the same if we reflect through the blackboard. So what happens? So what was formerly because we switch the role of over and under, if we, if the plus resolution before, the one that gave us an A term, was, uh, was this one at this crossing, now the plus resolution will be, will be this one. So the, the A, the A uh, factor comes from the positive one in each case, so it comes from the, from the different choice of resolution. And then when you go all the way down to the bottom, you, if you pick some sequence of A's and, uh, A's and A inverses, and you get some collection of curves here, there's some corresponding choice where you make the opposite choice at each time here, and you get to the same collection of curves. And here you'll just get a power of A squared minus A squared minus A to the minus 2 to the number of circles minus one. And this is symmetric in the two powers. So when you, when you switch a squared and a to minus squared at the bottom, you'll, you're not going to change the power of a that comes up to that factor. So if you think a little bit about uh, counting all the factors that give you a given, a given power of a, you, get, uh, you switch a and a inverse. Uh, the state becomes 
minus, what well, I'm saying that that's right, the state becomes, the state, uh, the state that gives you a, some power of A here it corresponds to the minus state gives you the same power of A inverse here. Okay, anyway. But you get all the positive powers here, the final you, So you'll get the, this. So you'll just change the sign of all of them. So in particular, you see immediately that the trefoil is not equal to its, uh, to its reflection. This is, uh, this is actually uh, not so easy to prove. It's, uh, for example, it, they have the same fundamental group. So all the invariants that come out of the fundamental group are the same. And uh, the Alexander polynomial of the trefoil and its reflection are the same. So this was quite a hard theorem. This was uh, proven in a paper by Dane, which was considered a good paper in, in the 1920s. So it was quoted quite a lot. And, and by the way, let me mention it as an application. Hmm? I'm not, actually, I'm not sure offhand, because... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he he had the fundamental group, and although that in itself is not enough, it also there's if you keep track of additional information about curves on the torus, which is the boundary of the knot. That, that I, my guess is that that's what he did, but I, but I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, this is by the way an important question: Is k is a knot k equivalent to its reflection? Okay, so here we see two examples that, are, that aren't, but some curves are. For example, the, the figure eight knot. This curve, if you reflect it, is equal to its mirror image. It's not obvious. The, it's actually uh, a little tricky to see. You might think that you could just rotate it or something, but that doesn't do it. It's, it's you a think about three-dimensional uh, <coughs> object that, that will also take care of the reflection when you go to the plane? Uh, well, you could, you could certainly throw in reflections to, to the equivalence relation, yeah. right? But you may not want to, because sometimes it's very important to distinguish between these two. So a famous example is thalidomide. And a less famous example is aspartame. So I know every, everybody's heard of this. Anybody, every, probably everybody's heard of this one, too. These are both molecules that are not equivalent to their mirror images. So if something is, if a, a, mole, a molecule or a knot is equivalent to its mirror image, then it's called achiral. So if you can distinguish a left and right molecule, then it's called chi chiral. So it has a sense of handedness. And uh, so these molecules come in two forms, a left-handed and a right-handed molecule. And the chemical interactions of the two forms are very different. So I don't know which one was which, but there's a left-handed thalidomide, which was a very good sedative, a very effective sedative. And when they manufactured it, the manufacturing process didn't distinguish between left-handed and right-handed, so it manufactured both of them. And the right-handed thalidomide, which hadn't been tested properly, turned out to cause all kinds of birth defects. Aspartame is this artificial sweetener. Uh, one of them, the left-handed one maybe, is 100 times sweeter than sugar. The right-handed one is extremely bitter. So, so where it came out in the med cow um, the, uh, problem. Is that part of the part yeah, of the, the that one as well? Yeah. Okay. So chemists and biologists are are quite interested in ways of detecting whether whether things are chiral or not. If they're achiral, if you if they are equivalent to their mirror images, then in the manufacturing process you don't have to. Keep, you don't have to worry about distinguishing one from the other. But there, there is not just the more physical Yeah, well, 
That's that's right. There's some physical rigidity, and also the 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 molecules sort of have uh, you know they might look more like this, where they have certain bonds holding them together. So they're more like uh, embedded graphs than embedded knots. But still, these these techniques are used. So you can e try and extend the Jones polynomial to these objects, or look at closed curves that sit inside these objects to see if uh, they have chirality properties. So people do use this uh, these techniques to study chirality. No, that's a necessary condition. Uh, it's not sufficient. Yeah, it's not. But it's necessary. Yeah. Okay. It's an exercise. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure there is because it's not a test for chir It's not a consistent test for chir chirality. Okay, so let me now talk about the Tate conjectures for the last few minutes. Yeah, right. Well, listen, I've got, I've got a pr I'm proposing to prove a hundred year conjecture, so right. conjecture was well, open for a hundred years. Don't promise we had a uh, hundred and sixty years problem. Uh, Peter Kivas, oh, right, yeah. Okay. All right. So the Tate conjecture was about alternating knots. That's true, yeah. That's right. He proved the. Uh, okay, I should give him a reference. Right. <laughs> so, Amen, in uh, 1957, uh, proved, uh, or maybe it was actually a little before that, 55, he proved asphericity of alternating knot. So, for those of you who know, Amen is a, is a famous uh, game theorist who won the Nobel Prize for game theory. But he started as a knot theory, knot theorist. And he uh, lives one floor yeah, he, that's right. His office is upstairs. So he, he proved the asphericity of alternating knots. Links, actually. Knots and links. So asphericity means if you take one of these knots and you somehow stick a two-sphere in space, not intersecting the knot, so there's some very twisted two-sphere. Maybe it crosses itself. Then you can pull that two-sphere down to a point. So it's the second homotopy group of the complement of a knot is trivial, of a link, rather. You have to be a little careful, because it's not true for split links. For example, this two-sphere, which separates the two components, cannot be pulled down to a point. But for knots, it's always true that the complement is is aspherical, doesn't have any interest in two spheres. They can all be deformed to a point. That was a big conjecture. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, finally proven in uh, maybe 1957 or something. Just after he wrote his thesis, somebody proved it for all knots. And he had proved the special case of alternating knots. So. If you have just one a knot in a sphere around it, like yeah. It's in the three sphere. I should have said not an R three. So you shrink it on the other side then. Yeah. Good question. So alternating knots were a special class of knots for which slightly more was known than general knots. So what what is an alternating knot? It's well you draw a curve on, on the plane and now you create crossings where you alternate between over and under. So we'll start with an over, so then we'll go under. And then we'll go over. And now we come back here. And luckily, we're under. So we're OK. We can keep going. And now we go over. So we're alt now we come back here. Luckily, we're under. We said we were over before. So it looks like we got lucky. We were able to alternate between over and under. So here's a little exercise. Let's do it. 
Why is it that you can always do this? You can always alternate between over and under as you go around the curve. You never run into a problem. Orient the face. Well, this this is a. Uh, uh, yeah, but maybe you, maybe you know, as you go, as as you go along, maybe you've you go along and you've done over something, and you know, and maybe you've you go along and you've just gone under something. You, you alternate, and now you come back here. And you, your recipe tells you it's time to go over, but you went over the first time. Yeah, it's related. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So the answer, there's many answers. You're certainly right. You could do it with orientations. Uh, but one, one answer is that uh, as you go along here, let's, let's start labeling these crossings. One, two, three. And I come back to crossing one again. And it's number four. It's my fourth point I see. So I match an odd and an even. And then I go along, and this is five. And then here, and I'm at six. Again, I have an odd and an even matched. And seven and two, and eight and five. And, and I've, I've seen every crossing twice. So it's a fact that you always match odd and even crossings. Let me give you a little proof. You all know. So, so we can do an induction argument. You can make a, a round circle alternating, right? And then if you start making it more complicated by, we know all you need to do is write, we can ignore the uh, up and down. We can do Reitermeister type moves to get any, any, co any complications we want. If, if we have any, any curve in the plane, we can always simplify it by pulling it apart, and any time we see a singularity, it'll be one of these Reitermeister move type singularities. So if it was alternating before we did this, before we introduced this thing, then we can still make it alternating by choosing one of our two choices here. That, that's a kind of an argument you can make to show you can always get alternating. It also shows that uh, you get odd and even, because when you when you go between something like this and like this, you introduce a pairs of points, and so the odd even matching is preserved. Even here, you in introduce two adjacent points. Well, this is a little bit of of an aside. I could talk more about this because this this is uh, the kind of thing you study when you enumerate knots. But uh, I'm not going to have time to get to the alternating uh, conjecture. So, so anyway. It's a, I, didn't really ex I didn't really answer this question, so it's a good thing to think, think about is why you can always make a knot alternating. Uh, it's also closely related to the fact that you can color the regions with two colors. Right, so you can color the complementary regions with two colors. But that, that actually uses, uh, uses a, a deep theorem in a way. It, it's sort of trivial for polygons. But in general, it uses something called the Jordan curve theorem, which is, for continuous uh, curves, it's quite hard to, to prove. Anyway, so we have such an alternating knot. This is called an alternating diagram of a knot. And Tate conjectured that a diagram which is in, let me say this not quite correctly so that somebody can tell me how to correct it that is alternating has the minimal number of crossings that are possible. Okay, so it's not quite right, so what, why not? Not to have? Right. So 
you won't see a problem with this one. This one really does have the minimal possible number of crossings. So you, you can't find some other picture of this same knot, which has fewer crossings if it's on a, but it's clearly not com always true because this is an alternating knot, alternating diagram, and this can be drawn like this. Right? So, so we have to have an additional condition, which is a, uh, a reduced alternating Uh, diagram has the minimal possible number of crossings for all diagrams representing this knot type. And what does reduced mean? It means that there's no crossing that separates the diagram into two, two pieces. So we might have something like That's right. It is, it is intractable, that's right, but, but not for, alternating knots. for alternating knots, uh, you can't get cancellation, which is very important when you're enumerating things and counting things and so on. It's the one condition we have that says that these really are in their simplest possible form. So this was solved, this conjecture. Uh, well, let me finish saying, by saying what a, re a reduction is. You might have something like, a, let's see, this was under, so the next one will go over. Under. There, now it's alternating. Okay, this is an alternating knot. It's, again, it's not a minimal crossing projection because you have this separating crossing. This is, this is a crossing that intersects a circle once. The knot can be split into two pieces. Sometimes this is called an isthmus. The outside region comes in and meets this crossing on two sides. And if you see this, you can see this isn't minimal because you could flip this over and get rid of this crossing here. You could take this piece and, and flip it over. So if there's no such regions like this, which it's very easy to check when you look at a picture, then you do have the minimal number of crossings. And uh, let me uh, show you the argument. I'll sketch the argument in the last 10 minutes. So this was proven by three people independently shortly after Kaufman introduced his invariant. Soggy. And this will wait. Around 1986, I think. 86, 87, they all proved this, uh, the same result. They proved that, uh, that the number of crossings is connected to the span of the Kaufman bracket. So the span of the Kaufman bracket of a diagram, I'll define it in a minute, is always smaller or equal to four times the number of crossings. And if the diagram is re reduced and alternating, the span of uh, the Kaufman bracket is, uh, is equal to four times the number of crossings. So the span is the span of a polynomial is the difference between the highest and lowest exponents. Maybe I should make that a minus seven. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, what's the span of the trefoil? It's 5 minus minus 7. And what's 4 times the number of uh, crossings? It's also 12. So we have equality in this case. But if I took something like this, remember that the we worked out what the Kaufman bracket of this was. Probably I erased it. Uh, well, what was the Kaufman bracket of this thing? Was it? Uh, I forget already. No. So what is it? We should minus see. A to the minus, a to the third. minus a of third. So the span is zero, which is smaller or equal to four times the number of crossings. It's not equal anymore. So this is a test. If the span is equal to 4c, then, uh, then that means that, uh, well, in particular, it means that there's no, it, no diagram of that knot with smaller number of crossings. So for the, for the alter, reduced alternating, the span is equal to 4C. If there was some diagram with smaller number of crossings, well, the span would be the same for that diagram. See, the, the Kaufman bracket changes when we do a Reitermeister 1 move, but the span doesn't change because we just move, multiply by A cubed or minus a cube. So the proof uh, follows from these two assertions. And uh, I don't really have time to do both of them, but in, in the last five minutes, let me just show why the first one is true. Why is the span of any diagram smaller or equal to 4c, four times the number of crossings? Well, you start with some diagram. And now we resolve, we take various states. Some give us A's and some give us A inverses. And we can ask, what's the highest power of A that we can get when we've done all the resolutions? When we just have a bunch of curves down at the, down at the bottom, what's the, what's the highest uh, power of A we can get? And I claim it's, it's by taking the state S plus which takes every crossing to, to a plus one. Why is that? Well, let's say we take this state S plus. What power of A does it give us? Well, how, we have C crossings, and so C times, what we'll do is take, take a crossing and replace it by A times this. So what power of A will, we, will that contribute over here? You'll get an A to the C, right? You get C times, you, you pick up a factor of A. And then you have to multiply here by the number of curves that you get. Well, you have to multiply by the factor minus a squared minus a to the minus 2 raised to the number of curves minus 1. So that gives us the, po the highest power of a we get is c plus 2, this is the power of a, c plus 2 times the number of curves minus 1. And similarly, if we take the S minus, we'll get C minus 2 times. So this is the highest power, and this is the lowest power. C minus the number of curves here, minus 1. 
And the difference between the, those two So the span of the polynomial is equal to then 2c. Yeah, this is the this is the coefficient of minus a, right? Well, if it's the coefficient of a, then it's minus c. But I said it's the coefficient of minus a. Oh, in that case, maybe I want this. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So, right. So the span will be 2c plus 4 times uh, the sum of the number of curves in these two states minus 2. And then we, we have to ask how many, uh, how many, uh, curves are there in this. And the claim is that this number is small or equal to 2c plus 2. And the reason is that you start with this picture, which you get from s plus, and now you think of what happens as we move through a series of pictures from s plus to s minus. Each time we change one crossing, what happens? Either we combine two curves, we combine two curves to get one curve, or maybe a curve joins to itself, and, uh, well, that wasn't a very good picture. It may be that uh, one curve joins to itself, and one curve becomes two curves. But the number of curves changes by at most one as we move through this picture. And at some point, we can pass through a curve that's connected. Because any diagram, if I resolve it properly, I'll keep the curve connected. So there's some, there's a way from passing from one of these to the other, which passes through one at the, in the middle. And that means, if you think about it, that the, the largest side, you know, you have a sequence of, uh, you have a sequence of numbers. And each one, each subsequent number changes by at most one. And the total length of this is, is C. Then what's the largest that the sum of these two can be? Well, this one is at most, uh, and if this distance is, is K, then this is at most K plus one. And this is at most uh, C minus K plus one because each one of these differs by the most one. So the, su the difference between here and here is at most, uh, is at most C. So we have a power of two here. Where? Yeah, this should be a two, that's right. Oh, over here, you mean? No, no, no. Oh, no, no, this, no. this inequality less than 2c, 2c plus, plus 2, like this, right? 2c, or uh, 2c, 2c minus 2, maybe. Or 2c. Yeah, this whole thing will be less than 2c. This, this piece here will be less than... Uh, Two c, uh, c plus two. That's that's what I was arguing here. Uh, now this, I think it's c plus two. Anyway, I rushed through that. So, so in this way you get an upper bound on the span, and then uh, in the special case of redu this reduced alternating, you see that it actually has to be equality. That only these two outer pieces can give the highest order terms. So I'm out of time. So.
continue on Friday with some other topics. Yeah.